Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of Winter College 2022. For more than 18 years, Winter College has been the Alumni Association's premier alumni education event. We are so excited to be able to bring it to a broader audience again this year in our virtual format. We have had an outstanding lineup over these last two, uh, over the course of two days, rather. You can navigate the full schedule by clicking events by type on this website toolbar, selecting Winter College 2022 from the drop down menu. Feel free to join programs even while they're in progress. Don't worry if you can't make it to them all, sessions will be recorded and posted online. Today, we are going to talk about talk with Will Haygood, class of 1976, about his newest book, Colorization, 100 Years of Black Film in a White World. Colorization was recently chosen by the New York Times as one of the best books of 2021. Talking with Will today is another Miami alumni, Alex Tyree, class of 2011. Welcome to you. I'm just going to give a little bio on you both, and then I'll kick us off to get the conversation started. So Will, very good, as I mentioned, is class of 1976 and author of Tigerland, which was a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, Showdown, a finalist for an NAACP Image Award in Black and White, and The Butler, which was made into a film directed by Lee Daniels. He has been a correspondent for the Washington Post and the Boston Globe, where he was a Pulitzer finalist. Haygood is a Guggenheim and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow, and is currently the Bodeway Visiting Distinguished Scholar at Miami University. Among his journalism honors are the National Headliner Award, the New England Associated Press Award, the Sunday Magazine Editors Award, the Paul L. Meyer Single Story Award, the Virginia Press Association Award, and the National Association of Black Journalists Award for both feature writing and foreign reporting, among others. He received a BA in urban planning from Miami University. Alex Tyree is spending his career focusing on the who and how to empower his community to spark cultural change through storytelling. Tyree is a multifaceted creative with experience behind and in front of the scenes in creative direction, branding, partnerships, music, hosting, and production. Born in Cincinnati and now residing in Brooklyn, the 2011 Miami grad has grown in his creative career over the past decade in producing several creative ad campaigns with brands like the NBA, Uber, NBC, HBO, Cadillac, and helping launch partnerships like Quincy Jones and Macy's. Alex presently helps run Spike Lee's creative boutique advertising agency, Spike DDB, where he is creative strategy director. In addition to his work with the icon, Tyree was a cultural figure in building Hashtag CultureCon, one of the largest conferences dedicated and produced for creatives of color, and a founder of Feel the Space, an emerging, emerging music community created by creating music moments that we inspire a deeper feeling of connection to music. Whether through community, music, or words, Tyree lives to inspire those around him, feel more alive, more you, more free, and more true. He is an alumni ambassador of the Marcus Graham Project, a nonprofit with a mission for providing diverse talent the access to breakthrough in marketing, media, and related films. Alex is, as I mentioned, a uh, an alumni and a 2019 honoree of the Alumni Association's 18 of the last nine award honoring outstanding recent graduates. Um, that is quite an accomplished list of things for you both. How fascinating and we're really lucky to have you. So I'm just going to kick it over to you two um, to have a really good conversation about Will's new book, um, Colorization. So take it away, gentlemen. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, congratulations on getting through that, that long list of, of accomplishments and bios, because that takes a lot. Um, and out of all the things you just said, the one thing I, I did want to mention uh, is the last thing you, you just spoke about. And so I, I would love to just thank Miami, the Miami Alumni Board, for deciding to uh, 
bringing me into this conversation with the amazing, profound writer, Will Haygood, um, because it was when I was nominated and selected for the, la the 18 of the last nine that I wrote, um, one of my desires was to meet Will. And so here we are today, we're manifesting what was written about three years ago. So thank you again for this opportunity. I'm really excited to have this conversation, Will. Oh, thank you, Alex. I mean, you're very, very busy man, very, very gifted young man. And I'm, I'm mighty proud that both you and I um, have Miami roots. Um, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I'm very proud of you and, and what you've done. My goodness, uh, I used to work at Macy's shortly after Miami University and the job didn't last long. Uh, I needed you back in the day. <laughs> that's funny that's funny and so and it's funny that you bring that up you know thinking about back in the day because one of the things i mentioned to you when we first got to meet before we had having this conversation is um it feels a little full circle just for even our family connection right so um yeah. you know you knew my great uncle clifford tyree and now i had to get this opportunity to sort of exchange dialogue with you. And so it's sort of this thread of generations passing down stories. And we get to talk more and more about that today, the power of passing down these stories. And you've been such an amazing part of telling stories that haven't been told. And I kind of want to really start there. Um, when you think about all the work that you've done, all the, the literature that you've written, um, the columns that you've written, you know, one thing that has really stood out is the success of the butler. Um, and the success of that, obviously, um, as we talked about, has inspired some things that we're going to talk about today. But when I think about the impact of the butler and, and you know, the, the actual story and then the film that was adapted from the story that you wrote, it's, it's, it's so profound because it's just an example of the many stories of the unsung, unsung heroes within Black history. And we obviously owe an homage to you for telling and continuing to tell those stories. But when you think about the impact that it's made, how do you, how does that feel to you? How, what do you think um, is an opportunity for us to continue to add to that? And how does it feel to have received such success um, with that, with, with the success of the Butler? Um. One of the things, Alex, that I look for as a writer, um, yeah. I'll go into a bookstore and I'll look around, you know, strolling around. And often, if I don't see a book that I want to see, then it sort of starts to be in my mindset, all right, there is no Sammy Davis Jr. biography in this bookstore. Maybe I was, maybe I was meant to write it. So I did. Uh, I would say, okay, there is no Sugar Ray Robinson major biography in this bookstore. So I'm going to write it. That's what I did. In the great Thurgood Marshall, first African American Supreme Court justice, had a very contentious, very contentious. Uh, hearing in front of the Senate committee and nobody had drilled down and studied that whole summer, the summer of 1967 and uh, his battles with the Southern senators. So I, I told my editor, hey, that's, that's a book that I would like to write. This Butler had worked in the White House for 35 years across eight, eight US presidents. And he had never been able to tell his story or well, nobody wanted to know his story. Uh, and so I just knew it was a story that needed to be told so that the entire country in the world even, uh, you know, can look at these people and say, wow, these are significant figures in this nation's history. 
Wow. It's, it's such an amazing story to, to pick up on. And, you know, that film came out and the film was for the, adapted from what you wrote and the film came out in 2013 and it was a yep. ass pool of just amazing, I mean, iconic celebrities like Oprah, Mariah Carey, and, you know, the list goes on. Forrest Whitaker was the butler. Forrest Whitaker, of course, yeah. can't fail to mention him. Um, yeah. John Cusack. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I'm sure I'm forgetting some people. Lenny Kravitz. Lenny um, Kravitz, yep. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, when I was on the set with Lenny, uh, he wanted to tell me about his music. Uh, and so he did. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. That movie, Alex, when we were filming it in New Orleans in 2012, the story came out 2008 and, and finally started filming it in 2012. Uh, that was the idea that spawned my new book uh, because I was at a soiree in New Orleans for the cast. Oprah was there, Jane Fonda, Lenny Kravitz, uh, David, Oh, yellow, oh, um, mm -hmm. Oprah, all the, you know, wonderful people in that cast. And I was looking around the room at this multiracial cast. And I said to myself, my goodness, most movies don't have multiracial cast mm -hmm. in this country. They just don't. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I said to myself, somebody needs to write a book about this unique moment. I mean, Spike Lee, of course, you know, who you work for, ha, you know, is one of those few filmmakers who always has multiracial cast, uh, yeah. you know, but it's not the norm in cinema in this country. Anyway, I said that standing in the kitchen at this soiree for the Butler cast and crew and Terrence Howard, who was also in the movie, yeah. When I say it, my goodness, somebody needs to write about the historical moment of this movie in the history. And Terrence Howard walked over to me and he said, you're the writer, man. So you ought to write that book. And that really is the moment that the seed happened to have been planted. Mm. Mm. I think about when I hear that story, I think about like the quote, you know, we are the ones we're waiting for. A lot of times we're waiting for other people yeah. to tell our stories. And you've been yeah. a great example of taking ownership and taking the, seizing the opportunity to tell our stories. And so when you started to pursue this, so did you actually take on that project immediately after that? Or was there a gap in between when you had that conversation between Terrence um, yes, it was, uh, because Alex, I went back to your hometown. Well, not your hometown, but I went to a uh, city where some of your relatives live in uh, okay. Columbus, Ohio. And I wrote yep. a book about um, a all black high school uh, that won two state championships in 1968 mm -hmm. slash 1969 East High School. And that book it's called Tigerland. And when you look back at that, Alex, that sort of goes also right to what you had just mentioned. It was a story that hadn't been told. This all black high school uh, wins two state championships uh, right in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. They won a state championship in basketball and then three months later, a state championship in baseball. Mm. Amazing. It's a story that's like, and it's like Friday Night Lights and Hoosiers and uh, He Got Game all rolled into one. But nobody had wanted to tell that story. If those guys had been white athletes, they would have been on the cover of a box of Wheaties. Mm. But they were not. The story just vanished. And I kept flying back home on visits and sometimes I run into some of those guys. They had two championship trophies. Nobody in the state had ever done that. And to do it at a poor, all black segregated high school 
1968, 69. The school shouldn't have been segregated. I mean, goodness gracious, uh, but it was. Uh, and the fact that they won those two state championships to me was worthy of a book. So I set off on that journey to say that that book came out first, uh, 2013, and my little Butler book came out, and then, uh, and then I did another book about Thurgood Marshall, uh, and then in 2018, my Tigerland book came out, uh, and so Alex, you're right. That's another story that nobody told. And I had to sort of look in the mirror and say, well, Will, if you don't write this story, it might not get written. And I can't tell you, my hometown had a lot of events for the for the book when it came out. It also came to Miami University. Uh, and so I, I really thank my alma mater because they invited uh, the athletes uh, from that school in one of the coaches uh and we had beautiful events at miami so i really have to thank president crawford um in the first lady of the university because they really welcomed me back and they welcomed members of that team back and it really was beautiful mm. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 powerful to just think about all of the folks that influence uh, and make up what we create. You know, we a lot of times we tell these stories in such an isolated, separatist way, and really, it is all about the collaborations and the connections that come together to create this this confluence of of ideas and writing and stories to be told. And and I think about that when I thought about that a lot when I started reading your book. Mm -hmm. uh, there's such a beautiful thread there, um, and and not even take a step back. One of the things that you know, having working for working for Spike Lee and seeing how he works, and also just you know, growing up watching his films. One of one of my favorite films from him has always been Malcolm X, and mm -hmm. a gigantic yeah. achievement. Yes, yes, uh, just uh, just an epic, epic film. Yes, I write a lot about that. And as you know, in the book, yes, you know, Spike's exactly. life and, you know, why he wanted to make the film, why it needed to be made. I mean, that's, you know, that's a big story in of itself. That's a whole drama in of itself. Spike Lee originally hadn't had the opportunity to make that movie and he had to fight to get the script and, you know, it's a drama. Yeah. It Exactly, and that that was actually one of the chapters that obviously really stood out stood out to me because of my connection and and, and being able to sort of see the one of the things that was really uh, positively received about that film is the nuance he gave to Malcolm X. We felt like we got to experience him in a way that most people would have never known him and got to understand him and the nuances of who he is and what makes who he is. And I feel like part of that what was so exciting about that film is also what's so exciting about this book is you you get the context that gives so much opportunity to see it from a lens of the present um and yeah. and you made a decision to 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 really start um this book in 1915 and so can you talk a little about a little bit about you know your decision making and looking to edit this down to be 100 years or span 100 years versus what you may have intended to write it for the length of or the history of like what what was that process and why why did you make that decision making to, to start there yeah you know when you're talking about cinema uh it was important to me uh to explain the early magic of cinema I mean, just think what it was like for people in 19, you know, I mean, 1910, 1915 to walk outside of their house and to see a car for the first time, you know, with an engine rolling down the street. You know, that's a sensation that you would remember for the rest of your life. 
And walking into theaters at that time, it was still fairly new. It was magical. So in 1915, there was this movie that came out and it was called The Birth of a Nation. And it was based on a vicious vow novel that portrayed the Ku Klux Klan as heroes and it portrayed all black people as uh, heathens, as scoundrels, as rapists. Uh, and that novel was turned into that movie and it played on the big screen across this country for four years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was like a advertisement for somebody saying, we hate black people and, and all, and here are the stereotypes uh, and they're on the big screen. And so it was estimated, Alex, that one in four citizens of this country between the years 1915 and 1919 saw that movie. One out of four people saw that movie, uh, I mean, for four straight years. And so that's a heck of a, a heck of a cinematic hole that black people were pushed down into. Bill, we were, you know, we were talking about the uh, huge impact of the film, The Birth of the Nation had on not just black America, but really American cultural society as a whole. Um, and obviously it was, um, from a technical film perspective, it was well received, but you were mentioning some of the uh, very, very deep entrenched um, and atrocious um, aspects of it um, that affected us for, for and honestly, to this day. And, and, and um, we'd love to hear more about what you were sharing with us. Yes, I mean, when it came out in 1915, this movie, uh, the Birth of a Nation was the first Hollywood blockbuster in this country. It was the jaws of its era. Uh, you know, it made a lot of money. Theater owners started keeping their theaters open uh, longer hours. But it also had a flip side. It angered a lot of people. It angered most Black people. And there were white sympathizers and they started to picket movie theaters. Uh, they wrote articles that the movie shouldn't be shown in theaters. Uh, they even went to court to try to stop the movie. Uh, there were a few cities across the country that refused to show the movie uh, because it was such a violent cinematic attack against black people. Uh, the movie even had a premiere showing inside of President Woodrow Wilson's White House. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't know if this is a spoiler alert or what, but the book opens, as you know, with that. And then you go hundreds of years later, 115 something years later, and you see that Princeton University has removed Woodrow Wilson's name from some of the buildings because of his uh, attitudes on race and because of what he did uh, in connection with this movie. He supported this movie. Uh, and, um, and so when I looked at cinema, at the history of cinema, I knew I had to open this book and by telling that story. Uh, uh, and because that story really leads to a lot more heartache in America, cinema also leads to some uh, lovely triumphs. But when you look at that movie and you look at the mindset of Hollywood, and then you can see where the stereotypical characters, the Stephen Fetches, Amos and Andy, the maid roles, the stereotypical roles, 
You can see how entrenched they were for 40 more years until the late 50s when Black American roles started to evolve from those stereotypes that had been birthed on the big screen in 1915. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I have to just admit it was a tough thing to read to, to you know, understanding where, you know, where we have come. Obviously, there's a lot of progress to be made, but where we have come today in the world we live in today and to and then to put your your mind in in focus into the time of 1915 and how much of that racism was entrenched in media, how much it was entrenched and not just the storytelling of film, which was this new phenomenon, but how it really impacted actual lives um, of those during that time. And you, and you even hinted at it and talked more some about it in the book about how it's not long after that the race riots of Tulsa happened. It's not long after that the race riots in Chicago happened. It's not long after right. that. And then you can even, you know, fast forward of how these stereotypes and these tropes are put in such a film that a fourth of the nation has seen. I mean, that's almost unheard of today in media with right. all of these access to different streaming networks and films. A fourth right. of the nation saw this film, which was absolutely racist propaganda. And it pervades all of these different stereotypes that impact Black Americans throughout these last 100 years um, of film. You know, you look at the story of Emmett Till and what happened to him. You look and you right. fast forward in, into the Central Park Five, and we're still seeing a lot of these same stereotypes that played out in a film over 100 years ago. And so- Alex, yeah. No, right, right, right. Good point. Brilliant points. I was just going to say those are brilliant yeah. points. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, and, it, and I'm all, I'm so much inspired by you know the the nuance that you gave because it's it's so important to have that context when we look at the stories that we write today and and we we who are alive now have the opportunity to impact that we who are alive now when we are able to look at books like Colorization that you've given us we're able to see how we now can see the power of owning our narrative, the power of impacting and telling stories. And so even, even within film and outside of film, like myself, who's a brand storyteller, I see the power of creating diverse storytelling and telling it from a place of elevating the consciousness, humanizing us, giving beautiful nuance and uniting us in a way that's not going to um, create what obviously the birth of the nation did to our people and and the racist constructs that still exist today. Um, yeah. But I'm here to ask questions, so <laughs> I'm gonna get off that. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, here's something though that I find extremely fascinating. Yeah. You work with and for Spike Lee and when uh, he was in graduate school, Spike Lee wrote his thesis against the birth yes. of a nation. I mean, he he explored that movie deeply. All these years later, you know, young filmmaker Spike Lee in college in New York knows how epic that movie was, that uh, he committed himself to studying it. And he made a short film that was a uh, rebuke to that movie. I mean, you know, so that's how history swirls. I mean, they're, 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 you know, there's the birth of a nation and there's filmmakers and then there's Spike Lee and then there's you and then there's me. And you and me went to the same school and we, we're we in this space right now. It's all really important and needed. Yes, it feels like such a a beautiful thread, poetic thread, um, even through um, the struggles that you know many many have had to overcome because of um, the negatives, and and it, that was also something that, that I thought was really beautiful to read in the, the Spike chapter that I read. Just just hearing, you know, obviously, you know, I have some inside scoops on some of this stuff, but you, you give context to a lot of things that 
even, even I didn't know, or most people would not know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just even thinking about the, the, the naming of the production company, 40 Acres and a Mule, it's, it's yeah. all sort of inspired by, you know, his experience going into film school and seeing, right. and seeing those things and being like, no, this is how we're going to change our narrative. This is how we're going to own our narrative and tell our stories. Right. Right, right. I mean, Alex, I'm glad that you mentioned that 40 Acres and a Mule because the Black godfather of film in this country is Oscar Michaud, who became a homesteader and went out west because he was told by the U.S. government, if you farm this land as a homesteader, you'll be given 40 acres in a mule. Oscar Michaud. He went to South Dakota and he became a filmmaker and he made about 40 films between the years uh, uh, 1925 to 1953. Uh, and he is a giant. Uh, you know, he's on the cover of this book, his picture. So is Spike Lee and so is the late great Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, Pam Greer, Dorothy Dandridge all of the icons, the iconic figures. Yes. Um, and, and I love that you, you also provide the history for someone like myself to learn that as well and, and seeing how it would, you know, we usually start at a certain date, you know, you know about the Van Peebles and you know about the, uh, the Gordon Parks and you hear about sort of the more popular names, but it's, yeah. It's the one who's the ones who sold the seeds, like an Oscar Michelle. Um, right. That, that that really is beautiful to learn about. And those are the nuggets within colorization. So for those who haven't gotten it yet, definitely I recommend it, highly recommend it, not just because I'm talking to Will, but it's it's a really, really great read and learn. And so, you know, one of the things that um for me, I selfishly wanted to talk about a little bit is um, you know, just the the impact of not just filmmakers uh, specifically, um, but how um, black music and black musicians and, and, and there's a chapter in there talking a lot about um, Barry Gordy and his decision to get into Hollywood and make films. And can you just talk a little bit more about um, some of the influence that music has been involved with, with filmmaking Hollywood and, and storytelling in that aspect? Yes, you know, in this country, it's always been easier for a black artist to get a job in a band, in a musical band, as opposed to getting a role in a major motion picture. Mm -hmm. It's always been easier to play a horn or to strum a guitar or to write your music you know, than it has been to get a role on TV or in film. Uh, and when I started doing this book, when I would sit down and look at some of these seminal movies like uh, uh, Lilies of the Field or In the Heat of the Night mm -hmm. or Shaft or Superfly, Amazing. It was, it was black music that was really uh, steering these movies. It seemed like because you had the movie, and you had urban radio, and you. you I mean, that was the way, and that blacks heard about movies because the studios would not spend the same advertising dollars for magazines and newspapers on black movies that they would on white movies. And so you would be in a car in the 1970s and you would hear Superfly. I'm your mother, I'm your father, ooh, Superfly. And you sort of say to yourself, wow, I got to go see that movie. I mean, and you would rush out that Friday or Saturday night, all dressed up to see that movie. And the next morning, because I was, I was there in the 70s, and I mean, I was at college at Miami, but during the summers, I would see these movies. 
And so I see the movie on a Friday and on a Saturday morning, I rush downtown or over to Mount Vernon Avenue to the record store and I buy the soundtrack of Shaft or the soundtrack of Superfly or the soundtrack of Foxy Brown. I mean, and because there were hit records, uh, you know, there were hit records and that were connected to the films. It was, it was just an amazing story. When you think of uh, uh, the Weirs, Michael Jackson and Diana Ross and Ted Ross and Richard Pryor, well, that soundtrack was just beautiful. And I still have it. I mean, the Weirs soundtrack from the movie was just beautiful. It, yeah, it's, I mean, you can't go wrong with Michael Jackson, Diana Ross. I mean, it, it's yeah. amazing. You know, uh, yeah. You know, these people had, you know, real talent. You know, they could <laughs> sing, they could dance, they could act. I mean, you know, there were a lot of, I mean, not a lot, and, but there were some seminal Black musicals in the 1940s, of course, Stormy Weather and 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 you also had Cabin in the Sky. Uh, you know, these were some seminal, seminal black musicals, but they played in mostly segregated, you know, movie theaters. I mean, and look, this is a country that has a big, a big gaping wound, and that wound is race. It is. Uh, race has always frightened filmmakers. That's why we don't have very many movies about race in this country. Uh, you know, and it's hard to get them made. I mean, you know, it took, it took four years to get the butler made. You know, you know, folks had to go out and raise money hat in hand and they did. And the movie became a huge uh, success you know, but it wasn't like the studios wanted to make it, you know, it was a struggle. Spike Lee, of course, has had those same struggles. He always has to knock on the doors, you know, you know, he has to figure out a way to raise money. And you, and you mentioned Malcolm X, you know, he started filming and then there was a point where he ran out of money and he went around to several, several black entertainers, sports figures, and raise more money. You know, it's a hustle. Movie making is a hard, hard hustle. It's a hard climb for all people, but, you know, especially, especially for Blacks. Hmm. Hmm. Which is, I mean, it just shows the power of you making the decision to chronicle th this history because this will now live as an artifact as an asset for us um, as a culture to absorb, to see the thread, right? And how can we, you know, make not his story, my story, right? And really, really yeah. personalizing and realizing like we take ownership and there is no other for us to tell the story of, of our experience. And so, you know, you I, know, you know I, yeah, you know, it's very important too to note that there are many white heroes in this book, people who went out on a limb to help, to help folks like Sidney Portier, Harry Belafonte, Spike Lee, you know, he's mentioned this, you know, white artists, white people who work in the film industry will go out on a limb to help these people. Uh, and they have done that, I'm, you know, um, and I'm speaking of people like um, Ralph Nelson, Stanley Kramer, you know, those are big time filmmakers who were white, you know, who wanted to help tell stories that we usually wouldn't see on the screen. And so very important to mention those figures because they really, really went out of their way to make the world more fair to make the country 
better when it came to filmmaking, you know. And yet, you know, we have years like 2015 and 2016 where there were no black Oscar nominees. And of course that started, that started the Oscar so white movement, uh, a movement that Spike Lee had been talking about for years and people would sort of sneer at him, but he was onto something. He was speaking truth to power. There's no doubt about it. Powerful. What did, you know, I, I was curious as I was, you know, I'm, I'm still going through the book. It's, uh, but it's, it's a lot in there, but it's not as long of a read as you would think with, with covering a hundred years. Mm -hmm. What, what, had, what were some of your favorite um, aspects of writing the book as you were going through it? What, what did you enjoy the most um, as part of writing the book? Yeah, um, I really uh, like studying how a film how a film gets made you know from article or book to screenplay you know how a film you know how a film is birthed a friend told me he said will uh getting a movie made is like landing a plane on a moving naval vessel in the middle of the Red Sea at midnight. I mean, that's how difficult it is to get movies made. And so that was really, really fun to study that. And it was also a joy uh, uh, my goodness, to, you know, to study the careers of people, you know, like Paul Robeson, and like Canada Lee, uh, uh, and like Dorothy Dangeridge, uh, And Billy D. Williams and Richard Pryor, Harry Belafonte. I mean, you know, it takes a lot of people to make a film, you know, and uh, I mean, it was just astounding for me to study the friendship of Harry Belafonte in Sidney Poitier, uh, who not only had to keep getting better at their craft, but they also had to keep telling the world that you are wrong in the way you are treating black people. I mean, and so they were both movie stars and civil rights activists who went into Mississippi to risk their lives uh, to deliver money to get civil rights workers out of jail. I mean, there is a, really lovely connection with Miami and film and what happened. I mean, as you know, the three civil rights workers, Schwerner, Goodman and Cheney left Oxford and went down to Mississippi and were murdered in 1964. Well, Sidney Poitier and uh, Harry Belafonte gave money uh, uh, to help those freedom riders uh, get out of jail on bail several times. They either went to Mississippi or wired money, wired money down to Mississippi. That's, I mean, that's why I wrote in this book, Alex, the way I did. It's not a, it's not a uh, hooray for Hollywood book. It's a book hooray for the truth. Yes, we all love movies, we all love cinema, we want theaters to survive, but when you're black and you leave that movie theater, you can become uh, Trayvon Martin or somebody from the Central Park Five or George Floyd. I mean, you're back in the real world in this country. You're back in the real world 
50 feet from the door of any theater in this country. And you have to be careful. You know, the new, you know, the facts tell us that. The facts tell us that. You know, and I think that it's important to tell that story and to stop people from trying to ban books, you know, people who don't want other people to read history because they say it's going to make and my kids uncomfortable. But this is history. Those Southern monuments throughout the Deep South were emblems of terrorism. And those Southern monuments needed to come down. They did. Those were painful. Those were hurtful. Wow. It's, you know, it's just amazing to, you know, experience this multi-generational conversation about there's so many threads connected here, you know, that we touched on. Yeah. And, uh, this is a powerful, powerful moment for me. Um, obviously, you know, we're here um, under one of the more connective tissues of Miami University. And so I'm thankful that, you know, this conversation came together um, as alum. And and so when I look at your work, and I, I'm really curious to know, like, what are your memories from being at Miami? And what do you feel like has really influenced um, how, how that experience may have influenced some of your work? Uh, you know, I, I, I really loved my four years at Miami. I mean, I met, and I met some wonderful professors. I met some wonderful friends who I'm still friends with to this day. Uh, I, I, Alex was the first person in my family to go to college. And so it was one of those moments, like somebody walking out of their house and seeing a car for the first time, like, wow. I mean, to walk in and out of those red brick buildings was just beautiful. I mean, to, you know, to sit and to study, uh, you know, all, all sorts of subjects literature, history, psychology. I mean, it was just, it was really magical to me. I mean, not that, and there weren't in some trying times because there were, uh, but I mean, like, and it was one quarter and we won three quarters then. And there was one quarter when I was supposed to bring back a certain amount of money to campus after the summer. And my mother had lost her job. Uh, she was a waitress. Uh, and so I gave all of the money that I made during my summer job to my mom. And so I didn't have the $450 that I was supposed to bring back to campus. And, and I worried that I would have to leave, leave campus. Uh, but when I called the school a week before school was to start, uh, somebody in the financial aid office told me to be on campus uh, the first day of school. And I said, well, and what I'm trying to explain to you, sir, is that I don't have that money. I, I, uh, I just don't have the $450. And this person said, I heard you very clearly. And I'm telling you, I'll see you on campus when school starts. Uh, and he asked me to come to his office and I did. And uh, he found the money. He found the money to keep me in school. I mean, you know, and you just don't forget things like that. I mean, that's why, uh, that's why I really wanted my niece uh, to go to Miami and she did. And she graduated in uh, 2013. She graduated, Alex, the year that the butler came out. So how's that? And uh, her commencement speaker, uh, was her uncle. So how magical is that, man? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. 
That's, mm. that's poetic. Yeah. That is poetic. Yeah, yeah. That is that's, really pretty special. That's so beautiful. Well, you know, I think we got room for maybe one question. Um, this was, I'm just honored to have had this conversation. Um, it feels, once again, full circle, but I feel like it, it's creating more opportunity for us to have more conversations like this, um, whether it's, um, you know, on, on the chats like this or in person um, yeah. sometime soon. But but nonetheless, you know, I, 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 I'm continuing to dissect this book and it's such, once again, I can't, uh, rave about it anymore, but it's such a beautiful book to read for you guys who haven't gotten it yet. Um, but one of the things that I am really curious about, just you know, as we sort of move with this dismount, is where where do you want? What is like the writer's vision and desire for the reader to take away? What if if you could surmise that in a short few sentences or a short few moments? What do you really want us to take away from this film and? and and aspire to and be inspired to do um, going forward? Uh, that, and that cinema is a very important part of our history. Uh, in that if we seek to tell powerful stories uh, like Malcolm X, like Moonlight, like the Butler, like Selma, uh, uh, we can fill in history. We can start to teach people, look, we had an attack on the U.S. Capitol in this country. People who live in this country attacked our country. Uh, and it was all on TV. Uh, I think if more of those people knew about history that they wouldn't have tried to attack the U.S. Capitol to stop 8 million votes from communities of color from being nullified because, because black people have died in this country for the right to vote. And I think if more people knew that history that they wouldn't have done such a bizarre thing at the US Capitol that day. Uh, and so I think cinema can be part of the racial reckoning that this country needs to have. We really need to have that. I mean, there are enough good people from all races in this country uh, uh, to make that happen. I mean, and we have to stand up, you know, we really have to start acting like the United States of America if we want this democracy to endure. At the beginning of the Butler, uh, there's words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the screen, one of the first images on the screen. And it says, uh, only light can drive out darkness. And that's true. We need more light in the countries and cinema, cinema can offer that, I mean, one of many things that can offer that, but cinema certainly can. That's that's powerful. That's well. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I'm sorry, this, the technical difficulty seems to be the name of our game today. Um, I really wanted to thank you both so much for being here. This was such a, just a rich conversation. And I really hope um, that the two of you will come back and join us again. Um, I, this was really a rich conversation and really thank you both so much for being here. Um, Alex, particularly for you, I'm super glad that we could help make this connection. Um, I'm, in fact, really honored to, to listen to the two of you today. Um, I just want to remind the audience that Will's book, Colorization, is brand new and out and available at booksellers everywhere online, brick and mortar. You can find it out there and please go find it because it's really wonderful and it's got some some beautiful pictures from the movies in it as well um yeah. 
And we appreciate your understanding and flexibility, particularly as it relates to um, the magic of Miami Wood and our technical difficulties. And, and I hope people find it more endearing than annoying this day and age since we've all been here and doing this for, for a while now. So thank you all for joining us and to our audience for tuning in today. Please join us for our next Winter College se session uh, beginning at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time featuring Miami faculty member and author Daisy Hernandez and her book, The Kissing Bug, a true story of a family, an insect, and a nation's neglect of a deadly disease. We look forward to seeing you then. On behalf of the Miami University Alumni Association, thank you to Will Haygood. Thank, thank you to you. Alex Tyree. You two are just wonderful examples of what Miamians can be, what Miamians can do, and what Miamians represent um, in, to the world around them. So thank you very much. Love and honor to you. Love and honor. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Alex, so much, man, for taking the time. I know you're on the West Coast, but uh, but I'm so proud to know you. And, and I'll look forward to meeting in person. It's going to happen. It was an absolute honor. Will, thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Miami. I look forward to connecting soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.